Hey there, folks, and welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to continue with our discussion on constrained optimization by talking about Lagrange multipliers. This is one of the most beautiful but also more challenging topics from multivariable differential calculus. So take your time with this section. Carefully read over the examples in the notes, and please let me know if you have questions. So to motivate our discussion, I'd like to consider the following example, which we're actually going to solve in the next video. Here, we're looking for the global max and min of the function fxy equals y squared minus x squared, and we're doing this over the elliptical disk shown here. This disk can be described by the inequality x squared over 4 plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. Now, I know what you're thinking. Come on, Zach, isn't this just a closed and bounded set? We learned how to optimize over closed and bounded sets in the last lesson. We look for the critical points inside, we find extreme values of our function along the boundary, we compare their values and take the largest and smallest. Well, to that I would say, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is a closed and bounded set, and so the techniques that we learned before are still applicable. Finding the critical points inside won't be too hard, but optimizing the function on the boundary might be a bit more challenging. After all, our boundary components in the past were always made up of straight line segments. They were really easy to work with. But now our boundary is this ellipse, the ellipse described by the equation x squared over 4 plus y squared is equal to 1. How do we optimize our function over this complicated boundary? In this case, it wouldn't be so bad because you could always rewrite this as y squared equals 1 minus x squared over 4, and then use this expression for y squared in your function f of x, y. That would give you something with just one variable that you could optimize along the boundary just like you did before. But even in this case, you have to be careful. When you make a substitution with more complicated expressions like this one here, it can be easy to miss out on certain extreme values along the boundary. You can also imagine that if I gave you a more complicated function, it might be harder to match up the terms in here with the terms in your boundary curve. So instead, let's look for a different method. I'm going to show you a beautiful piece of mathematics that will allow you to optimize functions even along complicated boundaries. This is called the method of Lagrange. All right, so once again, we're looking for the extreme values of our function, but of course, we're dealing with a constraint here. The constraint is that the points we're going to consider have to lie along this boundary curve, right? They have to satisfy a certain equation in order to be considered. That equation we could write as g of x, y is equal to some constant k. So for example, in our last slide, that constraint could be written as x squared over 4 plus y squared equals 1. We're only looking at the points that satisfy this equation. Hmm, so which points along this elliptical boundary are going to give us the largest and smallest values of the function? Well, if you think about it, if we're trying to say something about the size of our function at particular points, we're really saying something about the function's level curves, right? The level curves of our function give us all points where the function attains a particular value. So for example, this is the level curve consisting of all points where the function attains a value of six. You can see here that none of these points are gonna lie on my constraint curve. So I'm never going to attain a height of six if I limit myself to just this curve here. So what do we do? We lower our standards. We can't get a height of 6, but maybe we could get a height of 5. Mm, no, no such luck. Again, no points on this level curve are going to lie on our constraint curve. So we continue to lower our standards. And you'll see that something magical happens when we lower our level curve to a height of 3. When we reach a height of 3, this point right here on our level curve just lies on this elliptical boundary. This shows that there's a point that satisfies our constraint where our function reaches a height of 3. And in fact, this is the best we can do. If we ask for any more than 3, well then we're considering a level curve that's farther away, and there will be no points on that level curve that lie on our elliptical boundary. So what we're saying here is that this point, where our level curve is just tangent to the boundary, we have a global maximum, and the value is 3. We can do the same sort of thing with the global minimum. We're asking, how far can we lower these level curves while still remaining on the ellipse? And you'll see that it's going to occur right here when the value is negative 1. 
If we lower it any further, we're no longer going to have any points on our ellipse. So here, where the level curve is just tangent to the constraint curve, we have our global minimum. This, folks, is the big idea behind the method of Lagrange. The global max and min of a function f, subject to a constraint g of x, y equals k, will occur at points where the level curves of f are just tangent to the constraint curve. This would be a great time to pause the video and make sure you really understood everything that just took place. Okay, we've just discovered the big idea behind the method of Lagrange. This is exciting because it's telling us where to look for the extreme values of our function subject to this constraint. It says, look for points where the level curves of f are just tangent to the constraint curve g of x, y equals k. But how do you do that mathematically? Like if I were to give you functions f and g, and I said, find the points where the level curves of f are tangent to this constraint curve, I mean, how would you do that? It sounds tough, right? But it turns out we can use our knowledge of gradient vectors to help us out here. So I want you to think back to what you know about gradients. Last week when we introduced this topic, we said that the gradient of a function f is always going to point in the direction of steepest ascent, right? It tells us where to go to increase most quickly. We also know that the gradient vectors are going to point perpendicular to the function's level curves. So in this case, my function is increasing in this direction, right? The level curves are getting higher. And since we know that the gradients are perpendicular to these curves, they might look something like this. I'm just going to go ahead and draw in a whole bunch of gradients for my function so you can get an idea of what the gradients look like at various points. We're going to get a picture that looks something like this. Okay, well that's the situation for f, but what can we say about g? Well, g is just a function of x and y, right? So we can talk about its gradient. Just like for f, the gradient for g is going to point perpendicular to its level curves. Ah, but hold on a second. This curve that you see here, g of x, y equals k, is a level curve for g, right? We're asking for all x, y where g reaches a height of k. So the gradients of my function are going to be perpendicular to this elliptical curve. They might look something like this. Here I'm drawing them pointing outward, but maybe they point inward. The key here is that they're perpendicular to the red curve. All right, I want you to take one more look at our global max and global min. Do you notice anything interesting here regarding the gradient vectors? Looks to me like at both points, the gradient for f and the gradient for g are parallel. They're either pointing in exactly the same direction or in complete opposite directions. This, folks, is the key. At these points where the level curves of f are just tangent to the constraint curve, the gradient of f is going to be a scalar multiple of the gradient of g. So let's write this down. We're saying that at these points, nabla f is equal to some multiple lambda times nabla g. This is sometimes called the Lagrange equation, and it's this equation that we're going to solve to locate these points. This scalar multiple, by the way, lambda, we give it a special name. It's called a Lagrange multiplier. It's not just some useless number either. It contains information relevant to our optimization problem. I'm not going to get into the interpretation of lambda right here, but I will touch on this in my example videos. Before moving on, there's a small but important remark that has to be made. This equation, gradient of f equals lambda gradient of g, will always allow us to locate our global max and min unless we happen to be at a point on our constraint curve where the gradient of g is equal to zero. I mean, think about it. If the gradient of g is equal to zero, it doesn't matter what value of lambda you put here. The right-hand side of this equation will always be the zero vector. But unless we happen to be at a critical point of our function f, this left-hand side won't be the zero vector. So we're trying to say that something non-zero is equal to something zero, and it really just breaks down. So the moral here is we use this equation to find our global max and min, but we also have to give special attention to points on our constraint curve where the gradient of g is equal to zero. I'm going to summarize these ideas on the next slide, and then we'll jump into some examples. Okay, here's your summary, folks. The method of Lagrange. If you're looking for the extreme values of a function fxy subject to a constraint gxy equals k, 
Well, you can first locate all those problematic points, x, y, where the gradient of g is the zero vector, and of course, the points lie on our constraint curve. They satisfy the equation g, x, y equals k. Usually, this can be done quite quickly. The biggest part of the problem occurs in step two. We need to find all points x, y that satisfy the Lagrange equation. Gradient of f equals a scalar multiple lambda times the gradient of g. Of course, we should also make sure that the points lie on our constraint curve, so they have to satisfy this equation as well. I'll show you how to do step two in some of our example videos. Finally, once we've found all solutions from step one and step two, we're gonna plug those points into the function f. The largest value we get out is gonna be our global max, and the smallest value we get out will be our global min.